<laughs> well, I have to say Andy was one of the most extraordinary musicians I ever came across in my long life, 45 years at the New York Conservatory. His sound on the trumpet is so exquisite and so beautiful that I have it in my ear now. And it was <laughs> 30 years ago. Yeah. 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 So I was here visiting and um, Andy said he was running this program for the Future Orchestra Institute. And I said, I should be there. So I invited myself. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, oh, OK. You can beat me to him. So yeah, I know of no other person who's able to communicate the inner value of music to people as well as Ben Zander. It, it's over and over. I've, I've seen Ben just develop this incredible cult following, not only around him, but around the music itself. Even in in in, uh, in Boston, where you know, you know, that's really you know, taking you know, you know, having an orchestra in Boston of all places. You know, it's really bringing close to Newcastle with the Boston Symphony. Yet, Ben's in Boston Philharmonic has its own following, and people they fill up you know Symphony Hall and these. And Ben has just been so, you know, it's so incredibly engaging. The very thing that we most want our audiences to know about the music, Ben is able to get across to people, and that's what makes Ben to me a real icon in the classical music world as well as a, a template for other orchestras to emulate to understand that it's not just talking about music at people to get them to have more information it's the inner world it's the things that we as musicians feel about the music and instinctively know about how how the music you know, runs itself and you know these you know these little motives and these you know themes and how it you know the things that we get about music you um, you will talk to audiences, and it actually means something. Mm -hmm. And and you and you're so much more because you've you know, you've raised so many generations of musicians. I count myself as as one of them who who you raised into the, yes yeah, right. <laughs> In, into, the, into the actual art of interpretation of playing from inside the composer's intentions. You know, one of the things you taught me was you know when we're when we're reading. Um, you know, concertos or sonatas and then leader is that you can find the, um, the the voice of the composer actually the piano part and that that's what that's the composer part and then he's he creates this other role for the soloist and that was um, you know that and you know, many you know, other things that you you know gave to me you know, to understand music you also give to the audience it's not just secret information for us right Terrific. So go and sit down. But I still have to read my thing. No, you don't. <laughs> so let me tell you why I invited myself. <laughs> I wanted to bring two worlds. We just heard from Richard an extraordinary story about a great orchestra at the top of its game, against actually against the odds. And I know Bruce Coppock, who is also a student of mine, who took over that Miami program and created it. I mean, it was a brilliant idea. Part of the reason, of course, that it was so brilliant is all the people who don't, the donors in <coughs> Cleveland all go to Miami in the winter. So you can entertain them there and get their money from them there. Yeah. Anyway, that, that, that whole story that he described there, the Cleveland Orchestra, we could tell a similar story in Boston. I mean, the Boston Symphony is at a peak of both ability and fame and excitement and new thinking and I'm sure there are other orchestras around. So I think um, wh what I want to address is two, two things come from two areas. One is the world of what I call possibility thinking and the other is the question of how do we interpret music so it is an exciting and ongoingly thrilling experience because if we get too far into what I call the downward spiral, that looks like this. That's this, the shape of the downward spiral is like that. So if you take the famous phrase, the little old ladies are all dying, and so there's not going to be an audience. That's a typical uh, 
downward spiral statement of the music profession. Kids don't like classical music, they watch MTV, so they're not going to grow up and like music. And some other one. Then the National Endowment and the foundations of the corporation aren't supporting the arts the way they used to. You could fill this up very, very quickly with all the downward spiral speaking uh, just about our profession and the things that concern our profession. I think allowing ourselves to speak that way is a huge mistake because there's always another way of speaking and that looks quite different and it has a shape like this we call it radiating possibility and it goes out in all directions like this and you may be aware of the fact that many of you that I go out into the corporate world to speak about leadership uh, to vast numbers of Fortune 500 companies and organizations of all kinds. And the essential message that I give, it's a long two-hour presentation involving music and singing and so on, but the essential idea is that there are two ways of experiencing the world, two ways of speaking, two ways of being. One we call the downward spiral, and the other is called radiating possibility. And you could choose at every moment of every single day for the rest of your life, whether you speak from here or whether you speak from here. And most people, without really thinking or even knowing that that's what they're doing, they speak from the downward spiral. And they speak from fear and anxiety and pressure and competition. Now the interesting thing about this side is, I'm going to put this in my pocket, otherwise will come out. This is also about this. Because like the stock market, it sometimes goes down and sometimes it goes up and they look pretty similar. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So when, whenever you have a winner and a loser, you have the downward spiral. So success is also part of the downward spiral, just as failure is. Right. So it, the feeling around here is one of sometimes great stimulation and excitement, like a competition. You go into a competition, it can be enormously exhilarating or it can be very depressing if you win or if you lose. So this whole world of, I call this the survival world. And in this world, the main concerns in the corporate environment, and we're not talking about that here because we're all, this is the choir to which one always wants to be preaching, right? This is, <laughs> you're the choir. Right? But we, it's good just to know what we're dealing with. The whole television world, I mean, all those programs like, uh, you know, um, The Apprentice and How to Be a Survivor and, and uh, you know, all those things. Then you get, uh, uh, what's her name, uh, Paris Hilton telling us what she thinks about the world that's all in here. <laughs> American Idol. Oh my God, American Idol. <laughs> That's all over there. The trouble is that our educational system is over here too. Because you have a, an A here, and there's nowhere to go from an A but down. So we shouldn't be surprised if our kids look anxious. This is the world of anxiety, of pressure, of competition, of domination, and of survival. So most of the conversations that we have, without really thinking about it, live over there. Music, on the other hand, as an art, lives over here. Right? So there's a disconnect, because the profession, generally speaking, lives over there. The, the speaking that we do, the experiencing that we do. And therefore, uh, Richard said something very interesting about discipline. He said, the discipline of the outside world doesn't belong in the music world, because it's a different... We, he didn't mean playing an instrument. I say, actually, the discipline that is represented by these two boards is absolutely crucial in the arts world. To have the discipline to speak there rather than to speak here. Because if we fall into this, we're actually lost. And um, we, we lose our way and we, people lose faith in us because we're speaking. I, we are more like priests than we are like corporate executives. And the priest who loses his way 
and starts complaining and whining and things aren't going well. I mean, the, the sound of the downward spiral is wah, 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 wah. <laughs> It's not good music. <laughs> All right. So we have to be extraordinarily disciplined. Board members, m members of the orchestra, the, everybody to, to do with our venture uh, must be trained in this way. And as I was coming down here this morning, I was thinking, well, what are we talking about when we're talking about the, the future orchestra? Well, I'm actually conducting the future orchestra, and it's a youth orchestra. And the kids in my youth orchestra, the youngest is turned 11 yesterday, and um, the oldest is 21, and it's my second youth orchestra because uh, I, d I conducted one of them for... 39 years at the New England Conservatory and then I was fired as many of you know you heard about it in the press and and many of the members of the old orchestra came to play in the new orchestra and so we started a new orchestra normally when you have a bad experience and it was a very bad experience not only for me but for the institution and for the kids and it was a very very unpleasant time normally what you do is you get depressed you complain you have a lawsuit you know all that stuff that you do over there we said bother let's start a new orchestra and so we have a fantastic new orchestra it's called the Boston Philharmonic Youth Orchestra look he's beaming already <laughs> ear to ear um, well I'll tell you one way of, of just being really clear about what these two worlds are this is not positive thinking positive thinking is something actually positive thinking belongs over here. Oh good, you got that. It's clear, isn't it? Because positive thinking is pretending something is great when really it's shitty. <laughs> and positive thinkers are really extremely annoying people. I don't know if you've noticed. Possibility is something completely different. Now I'll, I'll tell you a story. It's a very, very powerful story. My father was a refugee from Nazi Germany. He lost, really you can say, everything. His mother was killed in the gas chamber of Auschwitz. Eight members of his family were wiped out in the death chambers. Um, he lost his home, his belongings, his money, and his profession, as well as his language and his homeland. He left, came to England, and shortly after he arrived in England, he was interned. I don't know if you know this, the English in their infinite wisdom, like the Americans, <laughs> Uh, interned the Japanese, they interned all what they called the enemy aliens. All right. So now here's this poor man with 2,000 other equally depressed people, upset people, who'd lost all those things in a camp with barbed wire fences in the Isle of Man. What do you think the mood was like in that place? Can you imagine what the mood was like? This was rampant, right? Fear, anxiety, pressure, upset, disappointment, every possible negative emotion was present. In fact, my father said some of the people were so anxious and fearful, they would sit and stare at the, at the barbed wire fence for the entire day. My father looked around and said, there are a lot of intelligent people here, we should have a university. And so they started a university in that camp, and they had 40 classes running regularly in that camp. There was not a single piece of paper, chalkboard, chalk, pencils, anything. It was just people talking to each other. Right? That is possibility. Where nothing existed, something was created. Now, if he'd gone around telling everybody how great everything was, somebody would have smashed him <laughs> in the face. <laughs> so positive thinking is not what we're talking about here. Nor are we actually talking about optimism, because optimism, strictly speaking, if you think about the word, optimism is actually a reaction to negativism. So the optimistic people, although it's clearly much better to be an optimist than to be a pessimist, at the background of the optimistic mentality is the unwillingness to deal with negativity. Right? which is why the British always say you have to have stiff upper lip. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we got those out of the way. Possibility is a domain entirely of its own. It has its own language, its own experience, its own expression. 
And you always know when somebody's in the place of possibility by looking at their eyes. Would you come here a moment, please? <laughs> right. right, you see, this is what I mean, right? <laughs> All right, thank you. So, so you always know whether somebody's in possibility. Now, here's a rather sad thing, and I'm talking now not from the board looking in, but from the orchestra looking out. As many of you know, not all of you are experienced in this, generally speaking, the life of an orchestra player is miserable. And that doesn't mean it is in the Cleveland Orchestra because they put a lot of attention on many things, but most orchestra players are miserable. And in fact, they did a study at Harvard uh, Business School, a famous study in 1995, and I think things have improved somewhat since then. Uh, they did a study of job satisfaction in different professions, 25 different professions, and they worked on it for months and questionnaires, hundreds of people were involved. And when they finished, they discovered that orchestra players, one of the professions they looked at, came just below prison guards in terms of their job satisfaction. <laughs> Heartbreaking, actually, when you think of it, really. However, very interestingly enough, the... the uh, profession of chamber music player, a distinction in the orchestra in the world, came out number one out of all the professions. Isn't that interesting? Because think about it, what really is the difference of playing a cello in a string quartet or playing a cello in an orchestra? I mean, apart from the numbers, the presence of a conductor is the crucial thing. And so the role of the conductor, and this is the thing that I make as my sort of central uh, thesis or through my central uh, um, idea in my conversations with corporate groups, because they all have leaders, and I make the point that the leader's role is to take people from here to there. And they have to be clear about the distinction. And so we've developed a whole lot of practices 12 practices, in fact, in a book called The Art of Possibility. That's the name of the book. And it's, it's called The Art of Possibility because that is actually an art. It's not a science, it's an art. And it has to be practiced and practiced and practiced. This is a book of practices. And as I always say, I won't be satisfied until when you go to a hotel and you open the drawer, <laughs> there'll be two books. <laughs> So what I wanted to do is to give you a little bit of, a, of an overview of how this uh, idea of possibility thinking works in an institution if you devote yourself with absolute passion and great discipline. Now in this new orchestra um, that we started three years ago, this is our third year, we had a complete blank slate because we, we didn't have anything. We didn't have a chair, a a music stand, no instruments, nothing, and no players. The first thing I did was I called up the, the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam, and I said, do you have a date in June? And they said, yes, they had one date available. I said, which, 26th of June was available. And I said, book it. They said, very good, what's the name of the orchestra? I said, we don't have the orchestra yet. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a leap into possibility. But I knew we would have an orchestra, and I knew that that tour was going to culminate in a performance of the Mahler Second Symphony in the Musique Freie. I don't know, in the Concert for that. In, in, and the reason for that is because we'd gone on a tour two years previously, or a year previously, with the other orchestra from which I was fired, and we had gone on a Mahler journey <coughs> from all the places where he was born and where he lived and where he conducted. And that ended in the Musikverein in Vienna. And I wanted to add one more thing, which is the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam, because that's where Mahler had the greatest love relationship with an audience, was in Holland. They loved him more, much more than in Vienna. And I wanted to culminate there. Well, I had an argument with the president about that and he didn't want that. So th there was some unfinished business. So we were going go <laughs> to do that. All right. So now you have to raise a lot of money and we raised $787,000. That was the first thing we had to do. But then we had to take these young people on tour. Now if you have 127 teenagers and you take them to Amsterdam <laughs> 
How many chaperones do you need? <laughs> what would you say? How many chaperones would you say? 254. <laughs> <laughs> that, if I may say, Phil, is the downward spiral okay. thing. <laughs> 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 So g g let's have a guess. What, what would you, how many chaperones would you take? Me? Well, anybody. Yeah. What? what? Sorry. Fifteen. Minimum fifteen. Normal. Normal idea. Yeah. Anybody else have an idea? Ratio of one to eight. What? Ratio of one to eight. Right. We know how how teenagers are. We, right. We know they need a lot of supervision. Right? What's that? With you, maybe no chaperones. <laughs> well, it's very interesting because we took four and they had nothing to do. And so the next year, this last year, when we went to Carnegie Hall and went to New York with 120 people to play in Carnegie Hall, we took no chaperones. And there wasn't a single incident of any kind that required an adult intervention. Now, why? Because they were living over here. The entire orchestra. Now, that was not chance. I interviewed each one of these young people, both for their playing and for their being. So the, the interview, far from being behind a screen, it was the opposite. They played their instruments, whatever it was, and then they sat down in front of me and we had a <coughs> conversation. And what I was looking for was a spark of interest, of engagement, of desire to be more than just a trumpet player. Or just a flute player. Somebody who is interested in, in, in society and the effect that music has on people. It didn't, have, didn't take much. Just some statement and that's who the orchestra was. And then on day one, I started training them in possibility. This year, first rehearsal, 45 minute lecture on possibility before we play the note. And then I give them assignments. Every week, I give them assignments. Assignments in being. So the first assignment this year was notice the downward spiral. Right? And one of them wrote a very beautiful thing. She said, I, I've gone through 15 years of life and I never knew there was a downward spiral. <laughs> right? And suddenly I notice it everywhere. And now I realize that I have a choice and I can change my life forever. 15 years old. She just wrote last week. So this week, the assignment this last week, the assignment was have a conversation for possibility that will get you a new direction in your life. Boom! Right? That was the assignment. So uh, the, yesterday was the rehearsal and I told the following story. One of the cellists, 15 year old Abby, had, was so excited to be in this orchestra and so totally engaged in this whole process that she called up her grandfather and he lives in Florida and she got so excited over the telephone and was telling him and emailing him back and he emailed her and so on and so forth and then he called me and said I'm going to give $50,000 for that tour you're going to take. Right. That's how it works. Right. That's how it works. And the person I complimented yesterday in the orchestra was not the um, not the grandfather, he was that child. I said, who does Abby have to be that he can ha she can have a conversation with her grandfather that is so vibrant, so alive, so passionate, so engaged, so committed, so clear, that he says, I'll give $50,000 for that. So I'm training the orchestra players to live and lead in possibility. And I don't take anything for granted. I don't take one minute for granted. I use every minute in the rehearsal and in the classes and wherever I can see them and, how, and, and I'm constantly on the email. And they write me emails and I write them back and I print the emails on the, my website and they go out all over the world. <laughs> It's really, it's hilarious, because we live in a possibility world. You realize this is the most exciting period in human history. You get that? The next 30 years are going to, without question, going to be the most exciting period in human history. And we have to decide what kind of world we want and who do we have to be for the journey. We have the tools. We can do anything we want now, because we can communicate with anybody. Now, I spent 45 years teaching at the New England Conservatory, and one of the most profound moments 
uh, in that process was that I came back from a class, and, and, and Brian was in the class, and you weren't in that class, but you were in the Walnut Hill class. But um, in the, Brian knows this so well. You actually did the class two years in a row. The only person who's ever done the class two years in a row. And so you really know it, and you remember it. I came home from this class one day, and I said to my partner, Roz, I said, Roz, what, what can we do? These students are so anxious about the pressure of the, of the grades and the competition and the auditions and, the, and they're so anxious what can we do because they cannot take the risks with themselves that they need to take in order to be great artists if they're bound and the, and the composers can't get through to them because they're so anxious about the pressure and looking at them. so Roz came up with this beautiful idea which has now become very famous um, which is to give everybody an A in the first class of the year Right. Everybody got an A, right? That was the first thing. And there was one condition to that, because the trouble with just giving an A is that then people would say, yes, but what's my grade really? <laughs> so the condition, the condition was they had to write a letter, the first two weeks of the class, you remember Brian doing this, you had to write a letter in the first two weeks but the date on the letter was May of the next year, when the class ended. Right? So there was, the date would be May, you were writing in September, and the first sentence in the letter was, Dear Mr. Zander, I got my A because. Right? Then they'd have to write a letter of some length in which they would describe who they will have become by the following May to justify this extraordinary grade. And I would tell them to fall passionately in love with the person that they're describing. And they did. They wrote about who they could be or they would be if only that st stupid voice in the head telling them they can't do it wasn't playing. Right? Then, when I came into class, the person I taught was the person that they had described in their letter. You see, I only take A students. Now, I not only, t only take A students, I only take A orchestral players. That doesn't mean that they're all equal. Far from it. It means that my relationship to each one of those people in the orchestra is that I'm speaking to the best part of that person, the part that wants to succeed, the, wants the part that is devoted, dedicated, and committed. Right? That's the person I speak to. And they respond in kind. And so there's an atmosphere when you walk into the room, which is very, very rare. One of joy, of engagement. Now, I have lots of other tricks. Like, for instance, if you make a mistake, normal response, mistake, go like that. In our environment, if you make a mistake, you go like this. How fascinating. It's actually, it's actually difficult. Try it on the golf course next time you're out. <laughs> And you know, the reason it's difficult is because the body physically actually pulls down when you make a mistake. Check this out. Next time you make a mistake, the body literally pulls down. So you're going against that. You make a mistake, you go, how fascinating. It's like this. <laughs> you know, it's difficult to do. Uh, and it's the reason why if one of my students has a problem, we had a uh, tenor in my class always sat in the front row, fully engaged, passionate, I mean, excited, you could rely on him. Well, one day I came into the class, and he was sitting in the back of the class. I'd never seen him back there. And he, his face was white, and he didn't say a word during the whole class. I mean, he was almost catatonic. So clearly, something was wrong with John. So I went around to see him after the class. I said, John, what's the matter? And he said, my fiancé has left me, and I'm not sure it's worth going on. And I could tell he didn't mean with the class. This was serious. So I put my arms around him to console him, but secretly inside I was saying, great, now he's going to be able to sing that Schubert song about the man who lost his beloved. <laughs> ah. <laughs> See, my teacher, I had a great teacher. His name was Gaspar Casado. And some of you know that name. You certainly know that name. The cellists know that name. It's one of the giants of the music world. 
And he taught me a lot more than cello and a lot more than music. He taught me life. And he used to say, you cannot play great music until your heart has been broken. Where does that live, that sentence? Is that, does that live there? No, that lives there. Because over here, we have broken hearts, and we have disasters, and we have catastrophes, and we have grief, and we have, in fact, everything. Everything in life lives here, and everything in life lives here. The only thing is, what is different is what you say about it. Now, all of you know the story, which I've told so many times, and now has been by, seen by so many people, of the two-shoe salesman. But maybe there's one person in the room who doesn't know the story of the two-shoe salesman. You don't? Great! I love you. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> so two-shoe salesmen go to Africa to see if they can sell shoes in the 1900s. And uh, they're from Manchester. And they both send telegrams back to Manchester with the news, how it's going. One of them says, situation hopeless. Stop. They don't wear shoes. The other one says, glorious opportunity, they don't have any shoes yet. Okay? Now, clearly, both these people are describing the same situation. You got that? The circumstances are identical. What's different is what they say about it. And incidentally, each one of those statements has not only words, but also music with it. So you think about it. Situation hopeless, they don't wear shoes. Situation hopeless. They don't wear shoes. Glorious opportunity, they don't have any shoes yet. And my hand went out, not because I said hand go out, but because when you say glorious opportunity, your hand goes out. That's what happens to human beings. And then your eyes shine. Look at her. You see her eyes are boo, lit up like that. So we are in the shining eyes business. Now, what, uh, what Richard was talking about was all the stuff that goes into running a huge operation. I'm going to say what we're really in is the shining eyes business. And if the, shining, if the eyes are not shining, we are not doing it. Now, I, have, I, I had an amazing a kind of an epiphany when I was 45, and you'll laugh at me for what I, <laughs> I actually discovered. I'd been conducting for 20 years with great success, and then suddenly one day, like on the road to Damascus, I went like that and said, oh my God, the conductor doesn't make a sound. Uh, my picture appears on the front of the CD. <laughs> but the conductor doesn't make a sound. Right? Now, he has power, huge power. But he gets his power from his ability to make other people powerful. What am I doing wrong? Oh, this is coming. <laughs> right, right. Let me fix it for you. Yeah, there we go. Usually I wear a tie, but you see, I didn't think anybody would wear a tie. Okay. Although Richard wore a tie, I could have worn a tie. <laughs> anyway, so um, the power of a conductor comes from his ability to make other people powerful. And you know, this was so, such a striking uh, realization for me that I promise what I'm telling you is true. Many members of my orchestra came up to me and said, Ben, what happened to you? They literally could feel the difference in the rehearsals between Ben Zander before and after. Before he realized that he didn't make a sound. <laughs> and after he realized he didn't. Because my job then became to awaken possibility in other people. That was my job. And of course, I can look around here and I can look at all your eyes and see I'm doing it. Right? Now, if the eyes are not shining, we get to ask a question. And this is the question. Who am I being that my player's eyes are not shining? You can do that with our children, too. It's a good question to ask. Who am I being that my children's eyes are not shining? And then, you know, I wanted, to, I wanted more information. So I started handing out white sheets of paper. That's, that's the white sheet. You all know the white sheet. You know the white sheet. The white sheet is my way of finding out what's really going on in the minds of the players. And it may be something to do with the practical issues. Like one lady, I put these out on the stand of every musician, every, con every orchestra I conduct around the world. 
and both youth orchestras and major orchestras. And the major orchestras basically ignore it, except the Israel Philharmonic. They went crazy writing. I got, <laughs> I got one, one member of the Israel Philharmonic wrote five pages. <laughs> and he began very beautifully. He said, I love everything you're doing, but I have a few suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> and they were great. And I incorporated every single one of his suggestions. But there was a lady in Aspen who wrote, can we have some more light back here? Well, think about it. She was trying to play the double bass and she couldn't see properly. And yet she could write, please, can we have some more? So we all got the people and we got more light for her. You know? And my tuba player, bless him, he wrote, I have 200 bars rest. Could you remind me when to come in? <laughs> So I wrote in my score, tuba, boom, and he was very pleased, big smile. But you know, <laughs> but this is not the ma majority uh, content here. What I get here is fantastic insights into the music, and sometimes fantastic insights into the experience. I brought a lot, uh, some of the white sheets from yesterday along, and, and, but I don't know where they are. I just had them. Yes, here they are, yeah. Yeah, very good, very good, yeah. Um, for instance, you, you remember the assignment? Notice the downward spiral, spiral and then have a conversation for possibility that gets you a different direction in your life. Then I told the story of Abby. I told the orchestra about her, his grandfather. And then I got, Mr. Zander, I will, this is a high school age trombone player. He's 15. I will definitely share my wonderful experience with someone. I come from a town where I'm the musical star and no one can really be in groups like this one. I want to share my experience because it's so great and I want more people to s strive to be a part of groups like this. Thank you and see you next week. But there was one much more moving one than that that was really very touching. Um, this is, a, this is a, a very typical, oh, this is lovely. Um, it's also a young cellist in high school, dear Mr. Zen. Now, who we had the story about the grandfather, so he wanted to tell a story about his grandfather. I've learned only recently that my grandfather is suffering from dementia. He's well into his 90s. So you understand that these were written on the spot on a white sheet of paper yesterday afternoon during the rehearsal, unprepared. He's well into his 90s, so we know he has lived an exciting full life, but nevertheless, it makes us sad to see his mind gradually lose its brilliance and capacity. The reason that I'm bringing this up is that for him, music is more important than ever. He has lost recent memory, and it's hard for him to grasp the details of daily life. But the more conceptual and personal things still stick with him. I know that it is probably hard for him to remember that I'm in the Boston Philharmonic Youth Orchestra, but deep down, he definitely knows I'm improving and growing both musically and socially. After every time that I've sent him an update by email about my orchestra life, he always shows great appreciation and support. He pledged to match my parents' donation for the European tour, and he says he can't wait for a recording of our November concert. He might forget that I play cello, or even worse, my name, but I will always know he will not forget the power of music. Pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. Yesterday, uh, last December, we decided to go to Carnegie Hall and play a concert in Car Carnegie Hall. Um, and uh, we had 2,000 people in Carnegie Hall. This is a youth orchestra. And the concert ended with the Shostakovich Fifth Symphony. And I spoke before the concert to the audience. And I said, it's well known the circumstances of Shostakovich's writing of the Fifth Symphony. He um, had written the F Lady Macbeth of the Metzensk district and had been roundly blamed by the music critic in Pravda. It turned out to be Stalin himself. And so terrifying um, was that that he became paranoid and he would sit every night 
by the, by the door with his newspaper with his uh, with his uh, suitcase packed waiting for the secret police to take him away uh, because he didn't want the children to be woken and um, and then he wrote the fifth symphony he hid the fourth symphony which is even more dissonant than the Mary, Mary, Lady Macbeth opera he hid it and put it in a drawer but he wrote the fifth symphony ostensibly to get himself back into the good graces of the Politburo the authorities and indeed it had that effect and the end of the fifth symphony as you all know is um, at least on the surface an enormously triumphant it's in D major the trumpets are blaring the drums are beating you know all that and everybody goes crazy at the end bravo and the polybaro look beaming from here to here because it sounds like a paean of praise to Soviet socialism in fact, there's a hidden message in Shostakovich's score, which is that the metronome mark for the final section is not 184 to the quarter note, but 184 to the eighth note, which is very slow. And if you play that end at that tempo, it's not a paean of praise to Soviet socialism. It sounds like a desperate cry of pain from behind the Iron Curtain. And it's devastating. We have at least two trumpets in this room who know what it's like to play that. When I did it for the first time, Tim Morrison was the first trumpet. He said, Ben, I almost died. <laughs> I said, that's exactly what Shostakovich had in mind. Those, those eighth notes, pa, 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 is like a wall. And the trumpets try to penetrate through that wall and they actually can't. And the end is devastating. And I promise you that every single string player, we had 42 violins and 18 violas and 12, 40, 16 cellos, every one of them using their whole bow. And like, pow, 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 pow. Imagine what that looked like with these kids. And then the trumpet blasting through. It was overwhelming. And it got an extraordinary review in the New York Times, this performance. They said they'd never heard the piece played that way. And it was... And there was a wild standing ovation in Carnegie Hall. And then, as if that wasn't enough, Lynn Records, one of the last great recording companies in the world, has decided to issue it as a disc, commercial disc. Isn't that amazing? I mean, this is a youth orchestra that didn't exist two years ago. That's possibility. <laughs> right? Isn't it fun? I mean, it's great. The whole thing is great. So I refuse to get into that conversation that Richard was talking about. We must not allow ourselves to get into the conversation of despair and fear and anxiety and pressure. It, first of all, it, it, there's an enormous... You realize this is invented, and this is invented. You get that? They're both invented. Everything is invented. So we might as well invent something that lights up our life, right, and lights up the life of the people. I was in a hotel last week in Miami, and, and it was a wonderful day, and it was beautiful, and I was on the 15th floor, and there was a gentleman standing beside me, and, and I said, how are you? He said, could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's typical, right? You say to somebody, how are you? Okay, not bad. Hanging in there, surviving. <laughs> I was over at the New England Conservatory. I said to my friend Larry, Larry, how are you? He said, breathing. <laughs> now, fortunately, we have little children. Do any of you have very little children? You have little children. Anybody has? You have, how old? What? Six and eight. I have a six-year-old, too. She's a grandchild. Right, so my, my grandchild is amazing. She's great. But she doesn't know how to walk. She skips everywhere. She goes like this. <laughs> now, you don't see this much on Wall Street. Have you noticed? <laughs> they don't do that on Wall Street. If somebody did that on Wall Street, they'd come along in a white van and take them away, you know. But all my grandchild is saying, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy you're here, too. Right? And there's a piece of music which goes with that. The Beethoven Seventh Symphony. It goes like this. It was the one you heard in the Cleveland Orchestra. Well, here's the difficulty with that piece. Because that rhythm, yum, is actually a very difficult rhythm. 
Because if you're a little lazy with it, it gets to be dum ba dum, bum ba dum, bum ba dum. Most people, when they play that dum ba dum, bum ba dum, bum ba dum, bum, that's not the rhythm at all. That's one two, one two, one two. You can do that for hours. It's a march. This is a dance. Yum ba dum, bum ba dum, bum ba dum, bum ba. When I recorded that, it was with the Philharmonia Orchestra in London. And of course, they knew the, one of the great orchestras of the world. Of course, they knew the rhythm, so they began yum ba dum, bum ba dum, bum ba dum, bum ba dum. But after a while, it became bum ba dum, bum. I said, no, no. I said the rhythm is yum ba dum. Oh yeah, yum ba dum, bum 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 ba dum, bum. And I said, no, no. The rhythm is yum ba dum. Oh yeah, yum ba dum, bum 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 ba dum, bum. Kept on falling back. My job is to remind the players what the rhythm of transformation is. Because the rhythm of transformation is lighter, brighter, faster, more buoyant than the rhythm of exhortation and blame. You know, like you should, you ought, you need, you must. And you know, I had this experience. I love telling this story. It happened 30 years ago. So there was, uh, I was in a hotel in Germany having my breakfast. And there was a little girl, five years old, over at the other side of the restaurant with her parents. She left her table alone and came towards me. I saw her walking towards me. She came like this. She came right up to my table and she said, Hello! <laughs> Hello! <laughs> it was incredible. Everything was open. Obviously, nobody had said to this child, Don't speak to strange men. <laughs> Probably by the time she got back to her table, they would say, But at that moment, there was nothing between that child and the possibility of relationship. So the question is, how can we have that hello be the rallying cry for this new world we're going into? And as I say, we are going into a new world, and we are the leaders. We are the leaders. So here's the thing. Let's develop a way of speaking and of being in the world. All of us, those of us who are responsible for this precious, sacred tradition, which is the great works of classical music. The pop world, they can take care of themselves. I went to a Lady Gaga concert. She's amazing. I mean, she put so much. If we musicians, we classical musicians, put half the energy into our music making that Lady Gaga does, we'd have no trouble at all. And you know, the classical musicians, they, they look as though they've played the piece 500 times <laughs> and could play it in their sleep and sometimes do. No. Right. So I, I work a lot with my kids to tell them to be free, to be expressive. We do one buttock playing. You know one buttock playing. One buttock playing is not this, but this. That's one buttock. Or the other buttock, like that. Right. Right. So when the music is flowing and you're thinking about more than just each individual note, and you know you can talk to bankers about one buttock playing because... In fact, one of them wrote me a letter and said, I was so moved by that thing you said, I, I transformed my entire bank, bank into a one-buttock institution. <laughs> because the trouble with the bank is that they're thinking about this quarter, and then the next quarter, and then the next quarter, and they're not thinking about the long line. And it's all about, I remember talking to McDonald's, and they were so worried because they had, they had a bad quarter. I said, it's like having a, a depressing Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't matter that much. You have to think of the long line. Think of the long line. Like, that's the secret. So these are some of the techniques of, of getting people, training people in, the, in possibility. Then there's a, a great, one of the great um, uh, practices of possibility is the one that, in the great story which was told to me by Boris Goldovsky. Do any of you know? Does anybody know? You know Boris Goldovsky. You remember him? He was so wonderful. He told me this story in his heavy Russian accent. I won't try to do his accent. But he said, two, two prime ministers come in, uh, sitting in a room having a conversation, and uh, the door bursts open suddenly. A man comes in. He's unbelievably upset, and he's smashing his fist on the, on the desk and shouting, and it completely disturbs the conversation. And then the resident prime minister says, uh, Peter, P Peter, please remember rule number six. And Peter's instantaneously restored to calm, just like that. Choo! And uh, so then they go back to the conversation. And then 20 minutes later, a woman comes in. She's hysterical, her hair flying and her pantyhose, you know, all that. And anyway, uh, then he says, Maria, please remember rule number six. Instantaneously, she's restored to complete calm. Right? 
And then 20 minutes later, it happens for the third time. You remember that? So the third time, the visiting prime minister says, my dear colleague, he said, I've seen many things in my life. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this in my life. Three people have come into this room out of control. And you just say rule number six. And they're immediately restored. Would you tell me what rule number six is? He said, oh, yes, rule number six. Don't take yourself so goddamn seriously. <laughs> so he said, oh, that's a very good rule. What may, I, what may I ask of the other rules? He says, there aren't any. <laughs> now, rule number six will do a lot for an organization of 120 kids going to Europe. You know, these things get into the bloodstream. They get into the way of thinking. Um, uh, success, failure. This world is a world of wealth, essentially wealth, fame, and power. Those are the three things. If you, if you think about it, human beings are geared to either think about a breakthrough in their wealth, in their fame, or in their power, influence. Those are the three things. Some people, all three of them, right? And now we have a whole system to develop that. You go to school, you work hard, you get good grades, you make contacts, you marry well, you know, it all works out, you get wealth and fame and power, and you have goals along the way. That's how the system works. Now, over here, look, look what we have here. There are no steps. Right? No steps. So what, what do you do over here? You stand in possibility. Right? That's all you do. And these arrows, where are they going? We have no idea. Right? Arrows. Chung! Where's that going? I don't know. Look. And my father told this wonderful story of the old man who's lying on his deathbed. He's very old, dead almost. And he has four sons around his bed. And he says in a weak voice, he can hardly speak, he says, there's a huge treasure buried in the field. Where? Too late, he died. Okay. Now the four boys go out with their picks and shovels. You imagine, they're four. They, for weeks, they dig and dig and dig and dig. They find nothing, silly old man. But the next year, they had the best harvest they'd ever had. <laughs> so over here, we don't know where the treasure is buried. But I tell you what does live here, and that is vision. Now, this is very crucial. A lot of nonsense talked about vision. And uh, a lot of people think vision is about being the best, being number one. I've many companies that I know that I've spoken to, they say, our vision, oh, and I don't know if any of you have been to the London Business School. Have any of you seen the London Business School? In the, have you, in the hallway, there's this huge plaque, stone plaque, great thing like this, made of stone. And it says, our vision, I promise, this is what it says, our vision is to be the preeminent business school in the world. Now, I went to the director. I said, you know, that's not a vision. She said, I know, but it's written in stone. <laughs> <laughs> now, a vision, to be a vision, has to be for everybody, okay? Everybody. Nobody must be left out. Otherwise, it's not a vision. And Mandela understood that, and Martin Luther King, they understood. Now, we understand that at the Boston Philharmonic. We have a vision. The vision is very clear. It took us a long time to find it. We spent two days thinking about what are we really about and what are we not about? What can we eliminate so that it's so like a, a soup which you get down to the essential. What do you call that where you get down to the essential of a soup? There's some word. What's that? Stock. Well, whatever. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here it is. Passionate music making without boundaries. That's it. Everywhere in the Boston Philharmonic, you see that. You open our brochure on the front page. Chung! Our vision. That's what we're about. We're about a vision. Passionate music making without boundaries. Now, the beauty of a vision, if it's a true vision, and you notice nobody's left out of that. You see, that's not for any particular group. Passionate music making, that's what we are. And without boundaries. It goes everywhere. So now we are run by that vision. We're actually not run by a person at all. We're run by the vision. We had a discussion recently about the ticket prices for the year after this coming one, and everybody agreed the ticket prices had to go up, except we all agreed the cheapest ticket prices had to stay the same. They've been the same for 30 years. Passionate music making without boundaries. Now, if you give your tickets back to the Boston Symphony, let's say you have tickets to the Boston Symphony, and you can't use them at the weekend, 
and you want to give them back, you give them back, and they resell them. Get some more money. If you give your tickets back to the Boston Philharmonic, we give them to Rosie's Place. Rosie's Place is a homeless shelter, and there are a lot of people at the homeless shelter who love classical music, but they can't afford the tickets. Right? You know, there was somebody at a conference I went to, and he was standing up in the plenary group. He said, 3% of the population likes classical music. If we could move it up to 4%, our problem would be over. I say everybody loves classical music. They just haven't found out about it yet. Right? And that's proved by my TED talk, because now 7 million people have seen that thing, uh, where I do the little thing on the Chopin. And beyond that, millions, everybody loves classical music. There's just no question about it. But they haven't found out about it. So how would you walk, how would you talk if you thought 3% of the population likes classical music, we could move it to 4 How would you walk? How would you talk? How would you be if you thought everybody loves classical music? You see, these two worlds are totally world. This is a world of a fixed reality. Here, the resources are fixed. So naturally, there's a lot of competition and domination and control and hierarchy and survival. That's where survival is. Here, there are an infinite number of people who want to hear classical music. So it's an abundant conversation. So Heidi, I'd love you to get your cello. Would you get your cello? That'd be great. Heidi used to be in the Walnut Hill School, which was this fabulous school, and he, she played in my youth orchestra. And then she came to Peabody very much with my advice, because I wanted her to come here. And she had a great time. And then she graduated. That's a perfect chair. And, and here she is again. And Heidi has always been one of those people who radiated joy about music. I mean, since she was a little girl. Absolutely, it was a natural thing for her to do that. And I would never forget her. So when I knew I was coming here, I said, find Heidi. <laughs> and they did, and here she is. My secretary found you. And how many years ago, when did you come to, how many years ago at Walnut Hill? Six years ago. And now you've graduated? Senior year. Great. Okay. Wonderful. So Bach, will you play a little Bach? The, the bourree. Heidi, how are you feeling about playing for these people? Do you see that? That's the downward spiral. <laughs> I, the, the mouth does it, and the shoulders do that. Okay, now, uh, Heidi, I've told you this story, but I'm going to remind you, and I want to tell them the story, because it's so beautiful. When Jacqueline Dupre, everybody know who Jacqueline Dupre was? Great, great cellist. When she was five, her mother told me this story, so this is absolutely authentic. Um, I played the two cello quintet of Schubert with, with Jacqueline Dupre when she was 15. It was an unforgettable experience. Anyway, when she was five, she went in for her first competition. You remember this wonderful story? And she was seen running through the corridor with her cello like this. <laughs> and one of the other mothers saw her and said, well, I can see that you've played. And she said, no, I'm just about to. <laughs> Isn't that great? She was five. She realized what a joy it is, what a privilege it is to play for people. How are you feeling now? <laughs> Excited, exactly. <laughs> great. You see, it's just boom, boom. <laughs> okay, off you go. Play. This is great. It's so, 
it's so pleasing to, to see you after all these years playing that way. It's just great. You're great. You've got such a wonderful spirit. Let me just get a chair. I'm going to come up and we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, what, is, what is this piece? What is it? This bure, what is it? It's a dance. Right. Did you notice anybody seemed to have an irresistible desire to get up and dance while you were playing? No. Yeah, you weren't watching. Well, I didn't see anybody. But, they're, <laughs> but you know, they're, they're, it's a very musically sophisticated group. They know all about heavy bars and light bars. And Heidi, you were doing a lot of heavy bars. Da da tum ba ba bum bum bim ba ba bum ba ba bim. So if you had to decide and reduce, would you do da da tum ba ba bum or da da tum ba ba bum bim bi? I think that's the one you would do, and it's natural to do that because there's a chord here and a trill and and the highest note and so on. But look at this da da dum ba da dum bim bi da da da. Ta-da-dum, ta-da-dum, ba-da-dum, bum. So actually the underlying structure is from the beginning. So can you give enough impulse on the first note, on the first three notes, so it carries you through two bars? Let's try that. Good. Let me suggest you do this. Do the first three notes, da-da-dum, like that, and then stop, and then do these three notes, da-da-dum, di 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 Right, so with the pause in da da dum bum 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 ba da dee dee Now throw it like a ball. I, I wish I could go down here, but I'm gonna go around the pillar here. Can <laughs> Heidi throw it throw it to me like like here. Three dee dee Now right to the back of the park here. Right here. Right, big one. Three Good. Three. Yum. And now put the music in between. Beautiful. You got it. That's fantastic. Great. Great. Wonderful. Now, next phrase. Good. So you've got a, a scale. Da da dum ba bum ba bum ba bum. Just play that scale. Da 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 la da la da. Beautiful. Now do it on one buttock. That's beautiful. And now add the notes in between. Still on one buttock. And now do it again and see what goes on, happens next. And is it ya pa 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 pi or ya pa 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 pi, which is Yes, exactly. So do so di yada yada di da di 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 di, and then it goes to di, and then to di. Gorgeous, and it's so beautiful that we want to hear it again, which is why Bach wrote a repeat sign there. Okay, here we go from the beginning. Three, di 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 di. One button. Di da da di di di, and then it goes to di, and then to di. Perfect. Is that gorgeous? Great. Beautiful. Now, let's go on. Now, wait, wait. The D. Da, da, da. Where does the D go to? It goes to... Exactly. So would you tell them that? Yes. You see the lady in the second row, she went... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Beautiful. You're great. You're great. Do it again. Yeah. Can you make can you make the D a little bit more beautiful so that we care what happens to it? Yeah, even more beautiful. No, even more beautiful. Just play the D. Ooh, there. Ooh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Now we have a rising line. There. Right. So, oh, look at that beautiful smile. Could you do the smile and the playing at the same time? It's very, it's very hard when you're playing to smile and play. Because we're little ones. So it's a big smile at the top. Here it comes. Yes, bravo. Very good. Wonderful. That's great. Go on. 
Now, which is it? Is it yararam or bo? Which is the heavy one? The bottom. And that's because you want to show how beautiful the wonderful cello string is. But that's actually a, a accompaniment. That's just a compliment. The C falls to be so sweet, and then to make that very sad. You all. Now, when you when you play the C, think about the resolution. You see the lady there? She was very, very moved by that. She was really touched by that. Wow. Are you a musician? No, of course not. You see, that's my point. You don't need to be a musician to be moved. That was moving. Anybody would be moved by that. Do it again. Mistake. So how fascinating. <laughs> People usually look like that when they make mistakes. <laughs> no, no, but isn't that great? And now she can. Now she's less likely to make, to make another mistake because she's in a happy mood. But that was really beautiful. Do it one more time. <laughs> This is sequences. Sequences don't have heavy and light. So da 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 do 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 Now one button for me and then he goes to G and then to C. Great. <laughs> now, now, they know it, they know it, they love it, they want to hear it from the beginning. Without repeat and put it right, you see the gentleman with the pink shirt play but all the way up there. Right, are you ready? Here we go. <laughs> Do you need this? Yes. You do. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. You'll hold this. What's your name? Karen. Karen. This is Karen. Just wait, let's have a chair. Here. Karen's had a tough month. <laughs> she's had a very tough month. Actually, it's been a tough year for Karen. So along comes Heidi with her cello to remind Karen how wonderful life can be. Right? Here we go. This is a little, a little cramped, but that's all right. There we go. Beautiful. Okay, here we go. So you're going to open that up. Right, here we go. Yeah, but Karen isn't there. She's there. <laughs> Bad love affair. <laughs> Lost a lot of money on the stock market. <laughs> Sick child. Yes! Stay where you are for a moment. This applause is not for you. It's not even for Bach. Do you know what Bach wrote? Do I remember me telling you what Bach wrote when he finished a piece of music? What words? For the glory of God. So he's not up there saying, thank you very much for all that applause. No, he knows that it's about something much bigger. I call it possibility. Okay? But look, what they are saying thank you what they are clapping for is they're saying, thank you, Heidi, for taking us to a world we wouldn't have been able to reach without you. Right. And I want you to look around at some of these faces here. Look at that. Look at this face. <laughs> look at this face. I mean, just look at this face. If you had a picture of this man's face, if you had a picture of this man's face on your, 
mirror while you were practicing. <laughs> because you know we get so worried when I we're... I get one for you. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know we get so worried. Look at this guy's face. Look. Isn't that beautiful? He's a trumpeter. <laughs> Imagine. Do you think that might change a little bit your way you, you practice? You think? Right. And you understand, Heidi had no idea what was going to happen here today. <laughs> this is what being available looks like. Great. <laughs> and, uh, so you see that these two worlds are totally separate worlds. And this is a world of the survival. And goals. You know how goal, how worrying goals are? We have to have a goal. You know, we've got to make the goal. Over here, there are no, there's no goals. Right. Oh, you can have a goal. You can have a goal. By all means, you can have a goal as part of the vision. And if you make the goal, great. And if you don't, how fascinating. <laughs> so it's a different world. So now we have another treat, which was that Brian, who's a former student of mine, said, while I was here in Baltimore, could I hear his sister play the flute? She has an audition with the Baltimore Symphony. <laughs> okay. Great, well done. It's beautiful.
this is, this is evidence now of the, the state of music in America today, which is this level of playing, which is extraordinary, has now become common. It's common. I was not expecting her to play any less well. This is normal. She has a gorgeous sound. She has perfect intonation. She has a beautiful sense of music. Right? So what is there to say? Well, I tell you what there is to say. It's boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's extremely boring. And it's not your fault. And it's not the fault of your beautiful golden flute. It's because of your misunderstanding of how this music is put together. Two things. One is, it's much too slow. How do I know? Because he writes adagio ma non tanto, which means easy, not too fast, and not too slow. Right? And then there's another thing, which is it's in four. It's not in eight. All right? And now I'm going to reveal something absolutely staggering, because just to do it faster, let's just do it faster. Mm. Okay, it's very nice, it's better, and it's more listenable too, but it's still boring. Isn't it amazing? I'll tell you why it's boring. And this is absolutely fascinating. The first note is an end in the cello. Right? That first note, can I just show, is, is an end. So the very first note is finished. Now. Just try that. How oh, fascinating. But isn't it, I couldn't stop because I was in love with you. <laughs> it was so beautiful. Here, now you take over. But do you see how suddenly you're free like a bird? Isn't that great? Do from here. Uh, where does it end? The first phrase here. Uh, do from there. That would be good. Then he goes again to G. No, the uh, F sharp G there. No, 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 wait, 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 you have to give her time, because she's a bird, she's flying. One <laughs> time, one once again, same thing. Find the freedom. Trill, trill, 
Suddenly, this creature, like a bird in a cage, is let free to be the artist she truly is. So that's the way to play. I've got one last thing. I don't know. I've lost track of the time. Can I do one more thing? Because she's got an audition with your orchestra. And she's going to play, she's going to play, she's going to play the Brahms 4, and it's going to be all wrong. So can I just say a word? What? No, just one phrase. One phrase. Keep playing. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. <laughs> okay, so this comes up in every audition, every orchestra. The flutes asked to play the famous solo from the Fourth Symphony of Brahms in the last movement. And then, I, I, as someone who sat on the other side of the, of the screen, in listening to auditions and talking to my colleagues in many orchestras, the thing that's constant that a dozen players at auditions is not making mistakes. It's not missing notes. Right. It's playing incredibly boring. Everyone can play the instrument. We assume if we selected the, the yeah. If, yeah. if, if we we assume that if, if we could assume that if we um, if we let somebody's resume, we accept somebody's resume, we let them come to the audition, we know they can already play. Right. But what, make, what wins auditions is heartfelt music making because us on, on our side of the screen, we're dying for someone to please play something that makes Stravinsky sound like Stravinsky, Brahms sound like Brahms the way we know it, and the way, you know, and, and so forth, like that. And so, that's, and that's, you know, that's where but our we've trained, is right now. We've trained a whole generation of musicians to play in their auditions like this. Yes, stiffly like this, so they don't make a mistake. Like the, 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 the like the Japanese girl, I said, why why do you never speak up in class? She said, oh, Mr. Zander, in Asia, very important to be right. Mm -hmm. Teacher always right. Student, try to be right. And then she said, best way to be right, don't say anything. You won't be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you can't make a mis you can't learn unless you make a mistake. Do you notice they both made mistakes, and it didn't matter a fig. Because they were making music. It was great. All right, beautiful. Play Brahms. Good, good, very well. Now, you played it just the way everybody plays it, and so the people behind the screen are saying, did she miss any notes? No, but there were two notes that didn't sound quite perfect, so next. <laughs> <laughs> but that has nothing to do with Brahms. Brahms was pouring out his soul. But I'll tell you something really amazing, which will blow your mind, and apparently nobody's noticed that Brahms left very clear instructions about how he wanted this phrase to be played. He said, Quarter note equals quarter note. Now, in my language, quarter note equals quarter note means quarter note equals quarter note. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely astonishing that nobody seems to have followed what Brahms writes. Do you see here? Quarter note equals quarter. So you're going along here, uh, um, for instance, and that's a quarter note. 
So let's try it, the way Brahms wrote it. And that means when you come to this, you still play the same tempo. One, two, three, one, two. Exhausted, exhausted, I would say, I want this girl in my orchestra because she can follow anything. She took it immediately, she got it, she did the timing, she was expressive, she was full of passion, just the way. Brown's one. Let's do it one more time. It's, <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Very exciting. <laughs> Very exciting. So, so notice that he has these crescendo diminuendos, espressivo, poco crescendo, and each one. So, e, da, 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 di, da, 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 f, da, 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 Start again, so yeah, she's so used to the other way. One. She's great. She's great. Okay. Now, <laughs> tell me something. Do you like that way of playing it? Yeah. <laughs> Did you love playing it? Yeah. Do you know that you're playing it with the way Brahms wanted it to be played? Because he wrote quarter note equals quarter. Are you willing to buck off? 150 years of tradition in every orchestra in the world and say, I don't care what you do, this is the way I believe Brahms wanted, moreover I love it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> She's honest. <laughs> She's honest. Because if she plays this way in her audition, she's going to cause some real consternation. First of all, nobody's heard it. They think she's made a mistake. They'll all go running for their scores and say, what's she doing? Or they'll say, Here's somebody who plays something differently, who has with her conviction, with her passion, with her certain knowledge, and with her brilliant flute playing, is teaching us something about the piece of music. Right. It's up to you, yeah. right? <laughs> I, I, I've had this experience many times where I've taught young musicians for auditions, and I warn them, beware. I said, you may not end up playing it the way everybody else plays it. And there was a cellist who I trained in the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, and it was the same thing, where he played it the way Beethoven wrote it, and nobody else played it that way. And the conductor got so excited that he not only took him into the orchestra, he made him the associate principal cellist. He got so, he said, he never heard anything like he was so excited. So it depends on what kind of organization you're working for. And I would say, I wouldn't want to work for an organization that wasn't excited about hearing. They're going to hear 97 flutes playing the same phrase. You know what Mozart said about flute, right? The only thing worse than one flute is two flutes. Yeah, but that's a mistake. <laughs> don't, don't, because he wrote beautiful music for the flute, and he, he was wrong when he said that. It's one of the, <laughs> it's one of the most beautiful. When it's played this way, with her beauty and her sensibility, it's, it's, it's maybe the most beautiful instrument. But anyway, it, it does bring up a very, very interesting question. Are we to go along with what everybody is saying and has said and the traditions that have been put forward 
and we get locked into that box forever. Or are we going to say, we're going to welcome people like you who are willing to play that way and take your, your luck with it. I promise the another 95 stu flutists who play, none of them will do that. None of them. And if you, if you do it with absolute conviction, with beauty, with artistry, who is the adjudicator at the back of that screen who won't be moved by it? Because for one thing, it's true. If you were inventing it, and it was your own peccadillo to do something different, I would say, don't do that. But when you're playing the, what's true for Brahms, and he clearly indicates it to be true, I would say, go for it. You're a great player, and it's wonderful to hear you play. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, I think one of the things you realize is that possibility is endless. Right? There's no way of stopping. Moreover, nobody is tired. I got up at quarter to three this morning because I, the things didn't go quite right because I'd just come back from Europe. And it, at quarter to three, I said, oh, shit, I'm supposed to sleep till five. Well, I didn't. So do I look tired at the moment? I am not tired. You cannot be tired when you're in the presence of possibility. And I dare say there isn't one person in this room right now who's feeling tired. And that's not because I'm very entertaining, which I probably am, but <laughs> it's not to do with the person. It's to do with this power, this overwhelming power called possibility that's available to us all every moment of every day. And I have a dream. This is my dream. Andrew, you started something rolling here. My dream is that as we go forward in this conversation, we only speak possibility. Only possibility. We can't afford to get into this and that we speak it wherever we go, when we enroll people in it, we get more and more and more people excited about it. And that's the way we're going to win this. Because if we get into that, we're doomed. If we speak over here and we allow our children and our uh, board members and our orchestra players to speak over here, this thing is doomed. If we get everybody over here and all I'm interested in, I have a thing uh, with my orchestra, with my Boston Philharmonic, I say, if you don't have a fabulous time, I'll give you your money back. <laughs> and I wait at the bottom of the stairs and I look for the shining eyes. That's all I care about. If the eyes are shining, that's it. That's right. So look for shining eyes and, and that's it. That's it. I mean, you know, we could go on and on or stop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>